That's crazy. Yeah. 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 Good evening. Does this microphone work? Can you hear it? Yeah. Says it seems to be on. I can't. It doesn't sound like too much. Okay. Good. I got thumbs up from the back there. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm William Marr, and I'm director of the University Archives. Thank you all for coming for another installment in the Archives Sesquicentennial Lecture Series, which is a, a brainchild and a result of the hard work of Alan Swain, the student life and culture archivist back there, who's sitting back there because she's not feeling too well tonight, <laughs> which is another sign of you know, the dedication okay. she's shown on this. Yeah. And um, I will let Julie Lout take care of coordinating the introduction for the rest of tonight's program, but I just want to welcome you to the University Archives and to say that one of the things we like to have seen happen, what's happened with the Sesquicentennial Lecture Series, is there's presentation from people's research in the archives. Julie spent a fair amount of time this summer at one of the tables here, uh, digging into the fascinating history of the University Press. And when she and I and Alan met a short time ago to get some ideas for putting the exhibit together there, um, it was really interesting to hear her story of the, of the press uh, and the press as a creature of the brain of the brain of Edmund James James, the president who more than anybody else uh, shaped this university as a research university in the period between 1904 and 1920. Um, and then to see that the press made an important pivot point during the administration of President Stoddard, our favorite fired president. There's, I don't know how many other fire presidents. <laughs> well, there, there are a few that you could kind of put in that category that left kind of like maybe, but he was the one that, the, the one that publicly was fired uh, in the newspapers and so forth. But Stoddard w was a, a president who worked to rebuild the university at the, after World War II, after a period that the university had taken a dive following James. The Roaring Twenties were good for the university. A lot of things went on. The Depression came and there was a tremendous amount of retrenchment and I'm channeling Winton Solberg here, but a lot of uninspired leadership by an engineer, um, with, um, Arthur Cuts, Cuts Willard. Um, and Stoddard came in with some very modern ideas and among the ideas was to look at consolidations of things like communication, uh, printing, and scholarly publishing along with seeing whether that could be combined with a library school and so forth. And, and he had some uh, ideas that would disrupt a lot of things in education, but among the, in the education here, but among the things he did was to bring Wilbur Schramm, who was a noted communications theorist, almost kind of a founder of that field, in, and Schramm was given the job of running the, the Institute of Communications Research at School of Journalism, what we now know as the media, the press, and various other things, and uh, Julie kind of enlightened us on, on that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing this tonight, and she will introduce the rest. Before I um, um, turn the microphone over, I want to call your attention to the next event in our Sesquicentennial Lecture Series, uh, which will be on Friday, April the 6th, from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. This will be in a different venue. It will be at Clark Lindsay, where uh, Professor Winton Silver, now 96 years old, uh, will be presenting on his latest book, which is due to come out. Do you guys have a date that's supposed to appear yet? Before April 6th. Before April 6th. Okay. March. The title, which he is very proud of, is he, he's been researching, as he's gone along in the James administration, he's tripped across other things that happened that were momentous there, like the creation of a medical school. Oh, that deserves a book. Let's do that. There was an expedition to the Arctic. Well, let's do, that, do a, a book about that. And, and now he is doing a book on creating the Big Ten, Courage, Corruption, and Commercialization, obviously about intercollegiate athletics. And so with that, I will turn the microphone over um, and look forward to hearing your presentation. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank also Ellen for letting me slip in about uh, a year and a half ago I'd heard about these sesquicentennial meetings that were happening between the archives and the history department and I sort of insinuated myself 
um, as an alum of the history department and as a you know, member at the press sort of insinuated myself into those things and was really excited to see what was, has been happening around the sesquicentennial um, on campus and the relationship that the press has been able to develop with a number of uh, departments around that as well. So I really appreciate her letting me sort of propose this panel so that we could uh, talk about the press's uh, 100 years of, of history here at the University of Illinois. Um, I definitely want to thank Bill as well uh, for listening to me. I was joking that uh, when I came in to talk a little bit about the research that I was done, they kept asking me more questions and I was like, you really want to know the stuff that I found? This is very exciting. Um, and I have to say that I'm a little bit giddy to stand here tonight because I get to revel in these two things that I'm really passionate about. Um, one of which is books and my work at the University of Illinois Press and the other which is history um, because I do have a PhD in history from the, from the history department here on campus. And I've been both a book nerd and a history nerd since I was in about fifth grade. And so it's really fun to have this opportunity to bring those nerdy loves of mine together um, throughout this year of working on events for this press's centennial celebrations. Um, I'm hoping that in, if you haven't had a chance to, that you'll take a look um, today as you're leaving to see the exhibit in the hallway that we've put together. This is a uh, a public history exhibit that was put together by myself and a small group of people, staff members at the press, who um, all have some kind of interest in history, and we had this great opportunity to look through our own work and the history of publication and art and design and present something out there for you um, to, to, to look through. We, the archives has also put together a very nice um, exhibit here in these um, what you call these flat exhibit flat cases? cases yes. Yeah, the flat exhibit cases in historic the back. cases. They're historic cases in the historic archives with history papers in them. So it's this <laughs> wonderful thing. But it's great because they are drawing actually from things that are here in in the archives, which I found when I started looking into the archives of the press that there is actually a remarkable amount of uh, information that is has now been looked at by myself and a few other people, and a much that still needs to be looked at. Um, and I think that you can see from what we put together in these exhibits that we have this great history of, um, of publications and these gorgeous covers and they really represent uh, a really broad range of work that we have out in the world in everything from African American studies to Heartland Foodways, Ethnomusicology and Lincoln Studies, Film Studies and Labor History and so much more. Um, but what might not come through, I think, in that exhibit that you see right now is really the people that are behind the creation of all of these things. So tonight we're going to get an opportunity to hear about some of the staff members and the faculty members that have um, had either are doing research or have worked in different capacities with the press. Um, but I also want to highlight in my short comments tonight a little bit more about the staff who have been so dedicated to the press to make it as successful as it's been for a hundred years. Um, and some of this comes from the comments that, you know, out of the comments that Bill was making. Um, we've had six directors in our 100 years of history, which I think is a pretty remarkable uh, achievement. It definitely speaks to the stability of our organization and the, um, at least what I've found in my three years working there, it's a really delightful place to work. Um, people really work collaboratively toward a shared mission, which is the dissemination of knowledge, right, from our, um, from our research institution and finding different ways that we can communicate with readers locally and around the world. Um, and this mission was started with our first director, Harrison E. Cunningham, who arrived on this campus from the East Coast in 1910. And he worked with President Edmund James to establish the University of, uh, University of Illinois Press in 1918. He left behind this very nice note in his papers that describes the many hours that he spent with James. He talks about them um, on his front porch and riding on the train, sort of dreaming about what the University of Illinois Press would look like. Um, and you know, James is, as Bill said, commemorated in our history as the scholarly president. And as Wint Solberg has also told me on many occasions, he was our best president, and I'm gonna go with that. <laughs> um, 
you know, he transformed the graduate studies program. He really laid the foundations of this library, which is a big reason that I moved here and never left. Um, but he also helped establish the University of Illinois Press, which has not been something that's been highlighted in the sort of histories that you hear about James. And I think that this year allows us a really important opportunity to highlight the fact that a press, a successful press, um, was really at uh, a crucial part of the way that James envisioned how he was going to make the University of Illinois Press prestigious on an international level. Um, he, unfortunately, he left just two years after the press was established. And so I believe that the relationship that he and Cunningham had and the commitment that clearly James had to establishing the press, as a result, was really never followed through. Cunningham was our longest uh, serving director. He served until 1947, when at the age of 70, he was forced to retire due to, um, a, a, at the time, a mandatory retirement age of 1970, or at age 70. So he was here from 1918 to 1947. And in that time, um, he really wasn't successful at getting other administration or board of trustees support on a broad scale to bring the press to the point that he would have hoped it would be, I believe. Um, James had actually purchased a property on, the, on 6th and Daniel that they had envisioned as a place for the press to live, so to create a building um, of its own. And that did not come to pass until um, the 1950s and 60s um, that, a, that a building was built, although I just recently looked at some of the, the uh, archival materials on that, and boy, were they like, let's do this as cheap as possible. It's really kind of amazing. <laughs> They're like, we, could, we don't need to care about aesthetics because it's just for the press, you know, this kind of interesting vision, right? Where they're like, okay, we need the space, but they're not valuing it in the same way as they were when they built Outgeld or when they built the library, and they were really envisioning this as a central piece. Um, but we know that academic presses and scholarly publishing really is at the heart of, of research institutions. It is the way that um, scholars who are working and researching and teaching at these universities, it's the way that they communicate their work to the world, and it's what gives them um, you know, their sort of uh, marks of approval and status within their field, and um, that is what the heart of the work that has been for us for a long time. It's interesting to note that when the press was established, we actually were also um, uh, uh, coupled with what was then called the Information Office. And so the press was an umbrella organization, Cunningham with Cunningham reporting directly to the president, and it was not only publishing some journals that were coming out and faculty work coming through our departments, but they also were overseeing the printing jobs for all of the university. This was our graduation announcements, course catalogs, mailings, um, you know, any, anything that a, that a university needed. And um, that was something that, that Cunningham had to try to fight on behalf of as well. Um, although it was, it was putting out something like 2,000 to 2,500 printing jobs per year, which added up to hundreds of thousands of pages of printing, they were located, the print shop was located in the basement of the Henry Administration Building. Uh, the ceilings were so low that there, I found um, a doctor's note in um, one of the archives where a woman hit her head knocked herself out and had to go get stitches because she didn't duck at the right time as she was moving materials through the print shop. And they also <laughs> reported on um, heat exhaustion because there was, of course, no air conditioning. They weren't allowed to open the windows because there was a fear that someone would come steal their things. So here you can imagine they're printing all of these things in this basement in the middle of the uh, you know champagne summer and um, and yet, all of these sort of calls to get the administration to make some changes to that were not happening. So it's quite remarkable, I think, that the press did have the prestige that it did, and it did, in fact, um, bring a lot of really important scholarship to fruition. Um, the majority of publications that were produced out of the press during Cunningham's time 
were by faculty members here at the University of Illinois. Um, in a lot of ways, what they were doing was a service. There wasn't the same uh, process of acquisitions, for, uh, peer review, editorial board review. Um, it was what departments were, were getting out and producing from those locations. We're going to hear more about that um, from our speakers today and publishing those things. Um, and when uh, Wilbur Schramm, who was only here for five years, but I think in a lot of ways was a really transformative figure on our campus, when he came and took over um, leadership of the press, he was very critical. He left behind this very scape, he, he had a very uh, blunt way of writing, so his, his work is, his, all of his papers are very fascinating and quite funny often. Um, but he left behind this very scathing note that said he couldn't believe the state of the press as he came in. Sales were only 1% of operating budget. Apparently there were stacks of unsold volumes that were sort of stashed in different places. Um, they were always looking for more storage space. What are we going to do with these things? And he was really critical of the fact that, that the University of Illinois Press didn't seem to be keeping up with the times. But I think that Schramm was very short-sighted, and he wasn't really attending to the fact that what he stepped into was a process that was already on its way to becoming what he helped make happen. Um, in the last years of Cunningham's directorship, he did end up pushing through a number of changes. He had, at the, at the university level, there was a report that was written where they investigated what, what strengths that the press had and what needs that they might have. And he also did this fantastic two-week trip, which I think there's part of documentation. He was very meticulous in keeping track of his mileage and how much he spent on lunch and dinner. <laughs> but he visited 12 different presses on the East Coast with the sole intent of trying to find best practices and bring them back to the University of Illinois to, um, to, to increase the prestige of the, of the press and, and bring it into what he saw as its possibility. Um, so by the time Schramm came, um, our editorial staff was no longer civil service. They had become um, academic uh, professionals which was an important transition in terms of the professionalization of the work that they were doing. Um, there was the beginning of an editorial board and a faculty board, and the beginning of, um, of looking outside of the university to a larger extent to bring the scholarship in to the University of Illinois Press, which, as we now know, is a large uh, portion of the kind of work that we're putting out there in the world. So when Schramm came in, he kind of he already had a, a lot of um, the mechanisms in place. But like Cunningham had had with James in 1918, and not again after James left, uh, Schramm came in and seemed to have an extremely close relationship to Stoddard. And in his five years here, we saw him, as we say, set up the ICR. You know, he was he was a mover and a shaker. He got things moving for our public radio station. He, you know developed our journalism, he, he was just this, and I think as a result of that, his persona and his relationship with the president, he was able to make these transformations that Cunningham was not able to put through, which included an infusion of money from the university <coughs> to support the work of the press, and Schramm could use his connections to get some really important scholars to publish with the University of Illinois. And I will point out, um, something that's interesting on our infographic you can look at back there, that um, the, the mathematical theory of communication, which was published during Schramm's tenure in 1949, continues to be, it's in print, and it continues to show up as one of our top ten sales through Amazon um, on a monthly basis. And so it really is evidence of the kind of <laughs> impact that um, that he had, that Schramm had in his short time. Um, I think I've gone way over. Uh, so <coughs> let me just say that we are in, a, in a, at a time where we often hear uh, about all of the negatives that are, you know, impacting academic presses, um, and you know all of the challenges that we're having, which are very, very true. Um, but I think that the press over the last hundred years has has found itself 
agile enough and with the dedicated staff enough that they've responded and, and continued to uh, produce an amazing array of scholarship and, and be in a very strong position 100 years in. And I am now going to turn the mic over to our presenters tonight to give us a, a deeper context of an understanding about the relationship between this campus and the press. Uh, Charles D. Wright, professor of English and Medieval Studies, has been at Illinois since 1986. A specialist in Old English, he is author of The Irish Tradition in Old English Literature, published by Cambridge University Press, and of over 50 articles and trend, uh, on Old English and Medieval uh, Irish Religious Literature, as well as on the reception and transmission of Biblical Apocrypha in the Middle Ages. From 1994 to 1996, he served on the editorial board of the Journal of English and Germanic Philology, which has been published by the University of Illinois Press since, well, I should say, it's been published by the University of Illinois since 1906, <coughs> so but well before we were an established press. After Charles speaks, Anthony will speak. Anthony Augustakis is professor of classics at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His research and publications focus on first century CE Latin epic poetry, but also the reception of the classics in contemporary popular culture. He was the editor of Illinois Classical Studies from 2012 to 2016, which is another publication by the University of Illinois Press, when he assumed the editorship of the Classical Journal, which he will uh, maintain through 2021. Antony is particularly interested in the U of I archives and the history of the Department of the Classics and only wishes that he had more time to devote to that research. And finally, Laura Hetrick has been with the University of Illinois since 2010 as an assistant professor of art education and co-editor of Visual Arts Research Journal. She works with undergraduates in the preparation for K-12 teacher certification in visual art and with graduate students in multiple <coughs> theoretical avenues, especially Lacanian psychoanalytic theory and Deleuze Watari philosophy. Her personal research interests include pre-service pedagogy and teacher identity, curriculum development, and my favorite aspect of her work, crossover fan art and fiction. So I'd like to ask you <coughs> to come up and uh, present his paper to us. Thank you so much, Julie, for uh, organizing uh, this panel. Can everybody hear me well? Okay. Um, we're here to celebrate partnerships between the University, uh, University of Illinois Scholars and the University Press, <coughs> including the long-running journals on display here, such as the Journal of English and Germanic Philology. But this evening, I want to talk about another ambitious publication venture at Illinois it began in the second decade of the 20th century, but abruptly ceased publication after its inaugural volume. This failed venture was part of a grand initiative to create an Irish foundation on campus. <coughs> Behind it lies the story of a woman whose vision for Irish studies at Illinois was bold, but whose energetic efforts to realize that vision were ultimately thwarted for both professional and personal reasons. <coughs> the story I'm about to tell is based on part, in part on documents here in the university archives. <clears throat> the Irish Foundation and its monograph series were the brainchild of Gertrude Shepperly, a scholar of medieval Irish literature in the English department from 1911 <coughs> to 1919. She'd had the most elite education, first as an undergraduate at Wellesley, and then as a graduate student at Radcliffe. This is a um, photo of her during her Radcliffe days. It's the only other photo I've been ever, 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 ever able to find. <clears throat> Shepperly had also studied abroad in Paris, Munich, and Dublin with some of the most famous scholars of the day. In 1913, a year after she was hired by the English department as an instructor, her monumental two-volume study of the um, Celtic analogues of the medieval love story of Tristan and Isolde was published. Perhaps because it was based on her dissertation, this was only good enough to get her promoted to associate. Not associate professor, mind you. The role of uh, the rank of associate was below that of assistant professor. Or perhaps skipping over a rank in the promotion process simply wasn't done. At that time, however, there were no women among the professorial ranks in the English department. And I can't help but feel that this had more than a little to do with the discrepancy between Shepherdly's scholarly accomplishments and her academic rank. That discrepancy was to rankle 
And six years and a second book publication later, it would lead to a row over the department's refusal to promote her to, to assistant professor. In the meantime, Shepherdly wasted no time in promoting Irish studies on campus. She had big dreams to make Urbana the center for Irish studies in America, and she worked tirelessly to make those dreams a reality. We go the wrong way. <coughs> we've, we've just heard about President James. <coughs> Never one to get bogged down in uh, the niceties of academic bureaucracy and lines of authority, Shepherdly went right to the top and succeeded in enlisting as her main booster the university president, Edmund James James. The university did not have, or at any rate was unwilling to commit, the funds to create such a foundation. But James supported Shepherdly's vision and her efforts enthusiastically, and he often involved himself directly in the planning and fundraising. In 1918, Shepherdly outlined her plans in an Irish academic journal. In her article, Irish Studies at the University of Illinois, she quoted in full a memorandum by President James, stating his intent to raise $100,000 in private funds to an endow an Irish foundation at the university. According to the memorandum, which was ghostwritten by Shepherdly, the foundation was to include a comprehensive library of Irish history and culture, an Irish archaeological museum, and a museum of Irish art, as well as generous funding to hire faculty specialists in Irish studies and to support their research and publications. Since 1915, she and James had focused fundraising efforts on Irish-American groups, such as the Ancient Order of Hibernians in Bloomington, which pro uh, provided for an annual St. Patrick's Day prize of $50. But their chief hopes for major funding lay with the Irish Fellowship Club of Chicago, an organization that is still thriving today. Shepherdly and James both made trips to Chicago to give speeches to the club. In a speech in 1915, James made a pitch for the club to fund an Irish library and museum on campus in the form of an Irish round tower. They didn't take him up on it, and it is hard to imagine an Irish round tower on campus. But here you go. <laughs> <laughs> While there was not yet a major gift to endow the foundation or build the round tower, Irish studies at Illinois was thriving. Shepherdly was often co offering courses in medieval Irish literature and even in the old Irish language. She had started a Celtic club that met regularly in her apartment and that sponsored Irish dances and readings of Irish plays. She had also begun stocking what she called our toolkit for Irish studies by acquiring facsimiles of medieval Irish manuscripts for the university library and replicas of medieval Irish metalwork masterpieces, such as the Shrine of St. Patrick's Bell, which you see here, for the Museum of European Cultures, now the Spurlock Museum of World Cultures. All the items in Shepherdly's toolkit were displayed just last year in a Spurlock exhibition that I curated, which some of you may have seen. By 1917, as this notice in the Daily Illini attests, Shepherdly had much to show for her robust efforts to create many opportunities for Irish studies at Illinois. Shepherdly's greatest coup was arranging for the most famous Celtic scholar of the day, the German Kuno Meyer to spend the spring term of 1916 in Urbana as a visiting professor. This was to lead in 1917 to the university publishing a monograph by Meyer that's on display here and that I'll discuss in a moment. The visit itself, however, was a disaster. The urbane Meyer, who was used to the amenities of the great European cities and who suffered from rheumatoid arthritis, found the Urbana Champagne of 1916 unbearable and left just after one week. <laughs> In a letter to another Celtic scholar, he complained that, quote, Urbana is a very primitive place, almost a village, without any comforts or, according to the European standards, even the decencies of life. And the climate did not suit me at all. A horrid, black, oozy prairie soil striking the damp through you. <laughs> Shepherdly was devastated by, by, by the fiasco, but she was not deterred. Meyer did agree to return for a short visit the following year to give a series of lectures, and he continued to support Shepherdly's efforts to create an Irish foundation and to correspond both with her and with James. He also agreed to publish a collection of essays of his own on old Irish literature entitled Miscellanea Hibernica in the series Illinois Studies in Language and Literature. I won't say any more about this series because my colleague Professor Agostakis is going to deal with it in his presentation. 
As for Meyer's contribution, here is how Shepherdly touted it in a speech to the Irish Fellowship Club. Her typescript is here in the university archives. She says, Perhaps the greatest service that the University of Illinois has rendered to Irish studies in the past eight months is the undertaking I am going to speak of now. The university has agreed to publish in its Studies and Notes in Philology and Literature a volume of old Irish philological and literary essays by Professor Kuno Meyer. The volume is called An Irish Miscellany and will be in press just as soon as our American printer can get manufactured the 11 new fonts necessary for the printing of old <laughs> Irish. We are making even the printers realize, you see, that there is an old Irish literature. I like to think of this thin, thin volume, for it is an historical event, as marking a date in the history of Celtic studies in this country. It is the first important scholarly work exclusively devoted to old Irish to be published in the United States. Shepherdly at first seems to envis have envisioned this series as a potential venue for future volumes in Irish studies. But funding from the Irish Fellowship Club led to a new plan for a separate Irish Foundation series. What the club actually funded was a fellowship for another visiting scholar, an Irishman named Andrew O'Kelleher, who has produced the first volume in the new series in collaboration with Shepherdly. The inaugural volume of the Irish Foundation series was duly published in 1918, supported by funding from the Graduate School. This volume was an edition with facing page translation of Biaha Call of Killa, a medieval Irish life of St. Colum Killa, a.k.a. St. Columba. O'Kelleher and Shepherdly's edition was actually issued under two different imprints. There was not yet a university press. This must have been one of the last volumes published by the press before the press was formally inaugurated. Uh, but the university published the book as volume 15, number 48, of the University of Illinois Bulletin, as you see here. The imprint reads, published by the University of Illinois under the auspices of the graduate school. The handsome cloth-bound copies, two of, one of which is on display this evening, had an appropriately emerald green cover with a striking embossed series emblem. This emblem, as you can see here, was designed after a famous medieval Irish silver book shrine. Here's a detail of the emblem alongside a photo of the Spurlock Museum's reproduction of the shrine, which reconstructs its original undamaged appearance. Simultaneously, a run of 300 copies for a private subscription series was issued for the Irish Foundation Series of Chicago, sponsored by the Fellowship Club. These copies differed only in minor ways from the University of Illinois Bulletin version. As you can see here on the left, the series title, Irish Foundation Series Number 1, was added to the top of the title page. The imprint was changed to <clears throat> published for the Irish Foundation Series of America, naming the Fellowship Club treasurer, and giving Chicago as the place of publication. To the back of the subscription series uh, copies was added an announcement about the Irish Foundation Series describing several future volumes in progress and projecting one new volume a year. There was also a form that one could cut out and mail in to subscribe to the series. But you already know from my spoiler that no further Irish Foundation series volumes were ever published. Nor did the great Irish Foundation envisioned by Shepherdly and supported by James ever materialize. In 1919, the whole enterprise collapsed when Shepherdly suddenly resigned from Illinois and accepted a position at Vassar. There were two reasons for Shepherdly's abrupt departure, one professional and one personal. The professional reason was the denial of her promotion to assistant professor by the English department. President James, who treated Shepherdly with great respect, always addressing her as Dr. Shepherdly, never Miss Shepherdly, had himself written to the department chair, Stuart Pratt Sherman, asking if the department intended to promote her, and if not, to explain their decision. In response, Sherman wrote a scathing letter, which survives here in the archives, in which he accused Shepherdly of cajolery and intrigue in her efforts to strengthen her position and of being rather consistently uncheerful in the performance of departmental duties. <laughs> we have only Sherman's account of Shepherdly's alleged shortcomings, and a hundred years later, it's hard to say for sure how fair or unfair it was. But colleagues in her field, such as Kuno Meyer, always spoke highly of her character and of her scholarship, while characterizations of strong women as resorting to cajolery or of being uncheerful are all too familiar. 
My own feeling is that whatever Shepherly may have done, or may be done without smiling enough to satisfy her male colleagues, one of whom, by the way, was a prominent anti-suffragist speaker, the professional consequences would probably have been far less damaging to her career had she been a man. Unfortunately, Shepherly's personal papers do not survive, so her side of the story is largely lost to us. But I have located a letter that she wrote in 1919 to the famous anthropologist Franz Boas, with whom she had become acquainted when she taught for one year at New York University in 1912. In this letter, she asked for his help in securing another position and explains in the following terms why she wanted to leave Illinois. In the first snippet reduced, uh, reproduced here, she writes, the members of the English department at Illinois are all in a state of discontent with the head of the department, and 10 of us are determined to express our disapprobation by leaving if we can get bread and butter elsewhere. At the end of the letter, in the second snippet, it becomes clear that Shepherly felt her prospects in the academic world were very much hindered by her gender. I haven't much hope that you can help me, because I know how unwilling people are to employ a woman in my field. No doubt the professional disappointment of the denial of promotion would have been more than enough reason for Shepherly to leave Illinois. But there was also a personal reason. She intended to marry another medievalist scholar on the English faculty, Roger Sherman Lewis, who was later to become the most famous scholar of Arthurian literature in the 20th century. At the time, however, Lewis was only an instructor. Shepherly wrote to President James, asking if she could retain her position on the English faculty were she to marry Loomis, who was then temporarily on leave as a corporal in the U.S. Army during the First World War. James replied that there would be no obstacle to the marriage as long as Loomis was in the Army, but that matters would be different if he returned to the English faculty. This was on account of the rather strict nepotism rules that then obtained. As things turned out, in 1919, Loomis was able to secure a position at Columbia University, and Shepherly was hired as, assistant, as an assistant professor of French at Vassar. They were married in August of that year, the start of what promised to be an exciting new professional and, profess and personal life for both of them. While at Vassar, Shepherly inscribed a copy of the subscription volume of the life of Column Killa to an unnamed patron of the arts. This copy, which I own, is on display here. In the inscription, Shepherly quotes from a poem in the volume, two rather somber stanzas about human life as a transient fable. The second stanza reads, for the fable more enduring, I will give the one more transient. With me in the grave shall not be blue, nor red, nor red, nor green the lovely. Sadly, within about a year of inscribing these verses, Gertrude Shepherly, Mrs. Roger Sherman Loomis, died of peritonitis at the age of 39. After Shepley had left Illinois for Vassar, Kuno Meyer lamented to her correspondent, quote, but now poor Miss Shepherly has been driven from Urbana, and all her and my plans for a great Celtic library, museum, etc., have come to nothing. It's not quite true that it all came to nothing, for the university still owns the impressive toolkit for Irish studies that Shepherly assembled for our library in our museum. But Meyer's Miscellanea Hibernica and Shepherly's own Life of Columcilla are all that remain to bear witness to her vision of a great university publication venture that was only to be a transient fable. Thank you. Many thanks to Julie uh, for um, uh, for uh, talking to me. Actually, coming to my office uh, a few months ago um, to introduce her, to introduce her herself and to um, talk to me about her passion, which is uh, uh, in the press, in the history department, but also in the archives. And uh, uh, it was it was sort of serendipitous in a way because I was pulling books from my uh, off from my shelves and saying. Huh, how about the uh, uh, this and that? So um, uh, it, uh, 
it's a, uh, it was a wonderful uh, opportunity and uh, for, uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, come and talk to you about um, the University Press, the Archives and the Classics uh, Department at uh, Illinois. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's, a great, it's a great place to be um, and uh, as Julie said, I unfortunately don't have the time to visit the archives as much as I want. Sometimes when I visit the archives, I find uh, stories that are very disturbing from the classics archives, so uh, it's, uh, it's best to leave them <laughs> uh, buried in the archives sometimes. <laughs> yes, um, like uh, white supremacy, for instance. But uh, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's such a rewarding experience to visit the archives, and I always remind the graduate students, especially uh, since they are the most likely to be interested in the rich history of classics. At Illinois, and um, I'm very happy to represent my department uh, tonight, uh, a department with a rich history in the uh, university that goes back to the foundation in 1867. Uh, and apologies in advance, I'm using both the columnated I uh, from the old <laughs> <PowerPoint> slides, <laughs> the classics department, and the new uh, the new I <laughs> we recently adopted. Uh, you're going to hear some names that we uh, that um, Charlie um, and Julie have already uh, and Bill have already mentioned uh, uh, in this presentation. But I should say that I'm grateful for a, a wonderful uh, publication of the press um, it, that talks uh, to so many of us about the history of the uh, of various departments and the university, uh, especially the early years. And uh, the article I've used a lot in my uh, uh, in this talk and, and my research in the archives uh, regarding the classics department is uh, written in this volume by no other than uh, Wynne Solberg. Um, so it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very important <coughs> article to read and I uh, recommend highly this volume. As you will see, the uh, history of the classics department is closely tied uh, to the long history of the Yovai Press. Um, classical authors like Homer, um, uh, Plato, Horace uh, were included in the curriculum from the very beginning uh, of the, from the foundation of the university, but classical humanistic studies, uh, education per se, as many of you know, was a controversial issue in the first decade or so uh, at the University uh, of Urbana. Uh, at the time, <coughs> presidents uh, Gregory and Draper were in sharp disagreement regarding the value of literature and arts as non-utilitarian disciplines uh, in the university. Uh, but, uh, back, but David uh, Kinley, uh, dean in the College of Literature and Arts from 1894, changed the direction of many uh, of our departments uh, in, the, in the case, in this case, classics. Uh, he fused the Department of Greek and the Department of Latin uh, into one on June 2nd, 1905, about 13 years before the foundation of the press, uh, with which the department has enjoyed a long history of collaboration. Uh, you can uh, see here, uh, for instance, uh, Ben Edwin Perry's monumental edition of Aesop's Fables in Greek, which has not been superseded yet. Uh, he only managed to publish one volume, but it's all of Aesop's uh, Fables in Greek. Uh, called the Aesopica, both the uh, 1952 edition and the reprint by the press in 2007. And you can also he see here the first volume of Illinois Classical Studies, which is also on display from 1976, and I will come back to that, the journal founded by Professor Miroslav Markovic in 1976, uh, an international journal in the discipline of uh, classics, uh, which I uh, was editing through 2016. And uh, as I said, I will come back uh, uh, to this in my capacity as former editor of the journal as I uh, talk about the uh, history of the discipline and the press uh, in, in this and other incarnations. So about how, how about this long history with, uh, uh, with the press or before the press uh, uh, began? Uh, it begins with a visionary and innovator par excellence, William Abbott Oldfather, born, uh, he is born in uh, 1880, a son of missionaries in Persia who returned at the age of 10 to the U.S. Uh, and entered Hanover College in Indiana, 
in 1893, age of 13, in their uh, preparatory department. William uh, uh, our father graduated in 1899 with a BA in first honor, entering in 1900 uh, Harvard College, college at the time, having taught uh, high school in Charleston, Indiana for a year. At Harvard, he studied classical philology, earning a BA, or I should say AB for Harvard degrees in 1901 and AM in 1902 before following the trend of the times in 1906, uh, crossing the Atlantic to study in Germany for his PhD, the only legitimate country to study classics at the time, uh, which uh, he received his PhD summa cum laude uh, in uh, 1908, uh, just two years after, those were the times, uh, at the Ludwig Maximilians uh, University in Munich. Between his AM degree at Harvard and his PhD in Germany, Old Father served on the faculty at Northwestern University, in which he returned upon graduating from Germany to teach, uh, 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 to, uh, to teach when uh, uh, the then uh, president of Northwestern, a figure we have uh, already seen uh, tonight, Edmund uh, James, uh, then president of Northwestern, became the president of Illinois, and finally managed to recruit Old Father in 1909 uh, to uh, join the faculty here. Incidentally, David Keeley, the dean, uh, wrote, as evaluating the candidacy of Old Father, he wrote that Old Father, quote, will not be among the uh, classical scholars of greatest reputation, but his work will always command the respect of his colleagues. Uh, of course, um, Dean Kinley needs that uh, part. It is not an exaggeration to say that Old Father transformed classics and the humanities broadly in Illinois. Uh, here are uh, pictures of uh, Greek theater plays uh, in uh, 1912 uh, from the archives, uh, 1910 actually. Uh, and uh, the famous uh, or uh, mm -hmm. uh, quite well-known hiking club, uh, 1909, a group uh, he is right there, his wife. Um, uh, 1909, a group of scholars walking every Saturday in the woods, singing, hiking, canoeing, playing baseball. <laughs> he always he said, always baseball, never football. <laughs> And those were the times, every Saturday walking, uh, if only we had the time to do that these days. One of uh, Old Father's many achievements uh, was uh, the support lent to the Classics Library upstairs. Uh, in 1907, the university purchased the library of um, Wilhelm Dittenberger of the University of Halle, and which was 5,600 volumes, came shipped by train to Urbana. It cost uh, the extraordinary amount at the time of $2,500. Um, as a part of the university's program to acquire, again, uh, uh, which um, uh, president, uh, the, the president was uh, promoting after uh, in the uh, early years of the uh, 20th uh, century. So to acquire scholarly collections in order to strengthen the library uh, for its research agenda. The library was then located at Alcott Hall, and the former Senate room became the classical seminar library. With uh, Old Father's arrival in 1905, the collection expanded to rival uh, the most prominent classics research libraries in the country, and especially uh, Harvard's, which was uh, the model. Uh, and we are still ranked as the, uh, the uh, top three, third um, classics library in the country. In 1914, uh, there were 20,000 more books coming from Germany. His, um, uh, and his uh, almost his close to his alma mater, uh, the library of Johannes Wallen, uh, with an extraordinary amount of uh, uh, programs and offprints from Germany. It is of note that uh, the university librarian Phineas Windsor uh, and Old Father were the only two faculty members who served from 1911 to 1932, uh, 21 years on. Uh, committees that drafted the university statutes, which is the voice of the faculty, uh, the governance of the university. But let us come to Old Father's collaboration with the press, before the press was founded. 
as Charlie already mentioned, uh, uh, there is a series before the foundation of the press. The university, starting in 1915, uh, initiated a series called University Studies in Language and Literature. You can uh, probably not read what it says uh, on the back of uh, its first volume, 1915. Uh, um, the series was designed for to include monographs in general linguistics and comparative literature, that is, the classical languages in Sanskrit, the Romance languages in English, uh, the Scandinavian and other Germanic languages. Again, from this quote, the title of the series will be so construed as to admit the publication of such researches in the history of culture as may throw light upon the processes of language and the interpretation of literature. It is a serial published quarterly, it says, for which the annual subscri subscription price is $3. A good deal, right? <laughs> the series editors in 1915, continuing for many years to come, were all father himself, uh, George Flom from Scandinavian Languages, and uh, associate editor of uh, the Journal of English and Germanic Philology that Charlie presented with you already, and uh, no other than uh, the infamous, in the case of uh, Charlie, uh, Stuart Sherman from the English department, uh, who died prematurely, he died in 1926, so now only a few years after she left the English department. Uh, I, 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 quite famous uh, in, in uh, the field of English. The success of the series in the field of classics was instant, and the other fields too, that I had not had much time to look at. Many of the titles that I've been able to compile, and I think I'm still missing some, these are the classics titles alone. Many of these titles, um, in this and the next uh, slide, uh, uh, were, went on to become uh, classic uh, reads in their subfields, uh, such as uh, the uh, Cicero book I'm going to uh, show you in a moment. Uh, there are many, uh, Many titles that are still in print and sell uh, quite well. So some of them are used in classes like the themes in Greek and Latin epitaphs by Richard A. Latimore, one of all father's students, and uh, who then be, uh, went on to become professor of classics at Brimwood College, and who is one of the most famous uh, translators of Homer in the 20th century. Um, and his uh, translations of the Iliad and the Odyssey are still widely used in um, classical uh, civilization courses. One of the most prominent books in the series, and you will see the copy uh, in uh, the exhibit, uh, is um, an, a standard uh, commentary uh, of Cicero uh, <coughs> until this very day. It was written by one of Old Father's colleagues, Arthur Stanley Pease, and it is. He was a coeval of Old Father, graduating in 1902, with an AB, in 1903 with an AM, and in 1905 with a PhD, all from Harvard. Pease joined the faculty here at Illinois in 1909, and this is the year that Old Father also came, so they came to the university uh, the same year, until 1924, when he left uh, for Amherst College, he actually became the president, and then uh, in 1932 he joined his alma mater, Harvard. Uh, I have a special relationship with uh, uh, Arthur Stanley Pease intellectually because he was the advisor of my advisor's advisor. Oh, so yes. he's second to my great A renowned botanist, uh, a plant is named after him, the uh, Draba Piacea. Uh, he, uh, uh, he penned this monumental uh, commentary on Cicero's philosophical treatise religious studies on divination, on ancient divination. Uh, it was published in two volumes as part of the series I mentioned in 1920 and 1923, and the picture I show you has his autograph uh, up here, a SP, um, and, and I purchased this couple some years ago. Um, and again, it's on the display table. I'm not sure about the development of the series, and here um, we lack evidence in the archives, so I'm not sure how the university studies in language and literature in the decades after the war, the Second World War, uh, developed. Uh, there's less classics titles 
uh, but it seems to me that it was the need for a more specialized journal in the field of classics, as in the other fields too, uh, and the proliferation of academic publications in the 1970s and afterwards that led to the creation of a specialized publication such as uh, Illinois uh, Classical uh, Studies in 1976. Uh, the founding editor was Professor Miroslav Markovic, who remained the journal's editor on and off um, until his uh, retirement, and my colleague uh, Angelika Zanetto is the current editor of the journal. The journal uh, now systematically uh, features, and that's another connection with uh, the great collections we have um, at, what one, at what once was the World Heritage Museum, now the Sperlock Museum, and the Kramer Art Museum, uh, excellent connect collections of Greek and Roman artifacts, and the journal now features uh, on every uh, cover page after 2010 a, uh, an artifact uh, from um, uh, the, uh, the collections at the museum. So that's a great way to uh, highlight what we, uh, and promote what we have. And um, enjoy a wonderful collaboration with Lydia Funkland and uh, uh, Kristen, who is uh, sitting uh, there, uh, and the staff at the press. It is, uh, and that's what I remember every time I visit uh, the archives and I look at the uh, rich history of, of my department, as I'm sure the other departments do, it is important to remember that uh, uh, a university, for a university in general, I think, to remember its history, but also to honor the legacy of our predecessors as we forge ahead in new directions for the next 150 years. Who knows what it will look like. Uh, <laughs> Public universities are under duress, I think that's, um, that's, that's another statement. And it's, it's more so than ever before, I think we need to look at our past if we stand a chance to uh, move ahead in, in, and succeed in the future. So one of the things that scared me, actually, from Charlie's presentation is I don't think Gertrude would have known that her letter would be in the archives oh, and know. brought up a hundred years I later. Know. I thought about that. <laughs> so I'm like, I need to be really careful about my Facebook posts and <laughs> my tweets because this archive has everything. <laughs> oh, and I need to smile more at work. Um, just like everyone else, I want to thank Julie for bringing this panel together. I wouldn't have met these two gentlemen otherwise, and they've been fantastic, so um, thank you. And again, I'm Laura. I'm an assistant professor of art education at the School of Design, and I'm going to be talking about Visual Arts Research Journal, and I am currently the co-editor, so I don't have a lot of historical um, information about this, but you'll get to hear about us now. So, here are some images. Um, since we're a visual arts journal, here are different journal covers of the journal over the last decade. So for a while, we were known for the four pieces of the pie. <laughs> um, and then we had the all-over image, the one in the middle, for a special edition. I don't think they liked that because we had to have so many image permissions. With that. Um, <laughs> they wouldn't tell you that. And then to recognize the transition to the new editors, we went with the bright cover and the bold text to visually mark our new trajectory. So at the bottom, I didn't design that, but that's our new one. Um, just to kind of like visually mark that there was a transition. So here's a very brief history of our journal. It's now in its 45th year. So I was just telling Charlie it came out a couple years before I did. Um, it's the longest running academic journal based in an art education program, and not just in the US, but in the entire world. So. It was originally titled Review of Research in Visual and Environmental Education, and its first issue was published in 1973. Its initial purpose was to publish critical reviews of empirical research that examined various dimensions of social behavior related to visual arts, as well as environmental design and planning disciplines. 
So over time, we've gone through three name changes of the journal, and I'll mention them from past to present. So in the beginning, in 1973, and only for one year, to 1974, we started as, as the review of research in visual and environmental education. Then in 1975 to 1982, we changed to the review of research in visual arts education. And then finally in 1982, we switched to our current name, which is still Visual Arts Research. And we feel this last iteration of the title is more broad and reflective of the transdisciplinary nature of art education, and also allows individuals from more diverse disciplines to feel compelled to submit their work to us. So here's some images of our different iterations. And to be honest, as an artist, I'm not so sure about that brown cover over there. <laughs> I don't think that speaks well for visual arts research. Um, so I'm really pleased with the visual direction we've taken with the changes in the covers. So, And actually, I think most of those are back on the table as well, if you'd like to see those. <clears throat> so of course, my editorship today could not be what it is without a shout out to the past editors of the journal. Um, and I actually knew one, so um, I was fortunate for the work of Elizabeth De La Cruz. So she's a retired professor of art education, and she preceded us as the editor from 2002 to 2014. So De La Cruz significantly expanded the readership of VAR through establishing a more uh, pronounced publication partnership with the University of Illinois Press. So while, while still maintaining a print edition, VAR is also now available online through multiple digital libraries, most notably Project Muse and JSTOR. Through expanding its presence and visibility, De La Cruz strengthened VAR's record as one of the most prestigious journals in the field of art education research. So I was talking to Julie when we were setting up this panel. Um, as a side note, I can personally attest to its international reputation. Last summer I presented at the International Society for Education Through Art, um, which is part of UNESCO, um, last summer at the World Congress in Daegu, South Korea. And in one of my presentations, as I introduced myself and I mentioned I was co-editor of Visual Arts Research, there was a noticeable murmur of recognition in the audience. Um, so immediately following that presentation, I asked scholars from all over the world, including Asia, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, that's what I could remember, um, line up to meet me and give me their business cards and inquire about publication opportunities with us. And I think that moment really hit me like, I'm kind of a superstar. <laughs> no, I mean, I didn't. <laughs> um, so many of them knew of the journal, but they had never met an editor. And I think as a scholar, you always think of these journals as this thing, and this press is this big building somewhere. But when you actually meet a human, and you're like, wait, that's just a person, and you get that connection, I think it just means something so different. And it was really nice to be in the placement of being the person as the face of the journal so that they knew they could talk to me. And I was very welcoming and like, send your stuff, just send it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a review board, so you might not get it, <laughs> you, know. you know, go ahead and send it. So it was nice just to be that kind of figurehead for once of uh, making it personal and knowing that there are people back there that are actually reading your stuff and everyone are excited about it. Um, so I spoke with each one of them for a while about their ideas and told them they get their papers in and then I gave them the website for online submission to the journal, which was also really nice. It's like, hey, you don't have to mail this to me anymore, because we used to do that. I mean, even when I first took it over, um, we still had to do, like, you mail three copies of the manuscript, and we have to mail those out to the reviewers, and they have to mail them back, and then it's online. It's so easy. That's <laughs> one of the things that the press made really, really nice for us. They streamlined that for us. So in the time since then, reflecting back on that moment, I humbly realized how I was part of something much bigger than the University of Illinois, or even the US field of art education. Because now our partnership with the University of Illinois Press, we had a global reach and a global reputation. And that was when it just, it, it all came, um, it just came to me. So our mission state, so here are some logistics of what Visual Arts Research Journal is and ascribes to. So like I said earlier, our current name of the journal allows for more diverse submissions from related fields. And this is our current mission statement. Visual Arts Research provides a forum for historical, critical, cultural, psychological, educational, and conceptual research in visual arts and aesthetic education. Unusual in its length and breadth, VAR typically publishes nine to 12 scholarly papers per issue and remains committed to its original mission to provide a venue for both long-standing research questions 
and traditions alongside emerging interests and methodologies. We that just we, we covered all. So. <laughs> <laughs> we actually worked on that. That's funny. I remember doing that group work. So, part of the operations, um, we have two issues published per year. Um, with proclivities toward helping art education scholars with gaining tenure, we always have one guest edited edition by someone in the field. So they must submit a detailed proposal of what, they, what their contemporary topic would be, and then it's chosen among any number of submissions. So we typically have quite a few, and the editorial board will meet, and we're like, this is really a contemporary issue that we're hearing about or we want to hear about, and then we'll select that one, and then they guest edit. So they do the call for papers and they actually edit those papers and choose what goes in. And I mean, we still have final say over that, but we like to encourage other people to help them with their careers too. And another reason we keep doing that is because as, um, as an example, before I was main editor of the journal, so back in 2012, I was selected as a guest editor for a Deleuze and Guattari special edition with two colleagues from the University of Alberta. So that was a great experience in the multi-operations of editing, and perhaps an open to the future, too, because I didn't foresee myself becoming an editor at that point. And likewise, we have one open issue also, so where any and all articles from inside and outside art education are considered as long as they fit somewhere within our vision of the journal's topics. You already heard that. Almost anything will fit. <laughs> Although I've said no, which is amazing, too, so it does happen. So while we have an edition currently in press, edition currently in press, our most recent issue that is in print is the summer 2017 special issue of Born Digital, and I believe there are copies back there on the table by the cookies. <laughs> <laughs> so our guest editors were engaged in speculation about the nature of technological ecology and asked the pertinent question, how might a digital publication afford different opportunities for art education and knowledge generation? So further, they wondered that if advantages were possible, what would be needed to sustain these digital publications as extended textual forms and reach a broader, more diverse global audience? Trying to push the boundaries of paper-based printed journals, each of the papers in this edition had links to web-based information related to their topic. Some had additional information or continuation of the paper, some had interactive elements, but all were pushing the boundaries of a static page in a journal. And Common Threads, so shifting gears, we are happy to be a part of the Common Threads series. And Common Threads, for those of you that don't know, is an anthology from the University of Illinois Press. Each volume in Common Threads brings together related journal content into ebook format, allowing the reader to experience several thematically related scholarly articles at one time. This innovative new series gathers hand-selected material by leading scholars in an easy to read <laughs> format meant to, read, meant to reach a wide audience of scholars and interested readers. So this is a Common Threads edition that my co-editor Jorge Lucero curated a few years ago entitled Mirror and Easy, Collage as a Critical Practice in Pedagogy. So in his edition, he illustrates how collage making offers everyone from small children to trained artists the ability to express themselves through images. In his Common Threads collection, Jorge draws on the archive of, the journal, of our journal, Visual Arts Research, to present articles focused on the place of collage in fine art and education. Guided by the twinned concepts of mereness, collage's reputation as a trifle, and easiness, the technique's accessibility to all, the selected paper's authors explore how subversive, debased, and effortless the collage gesture can be. What emerges is, in, in and of itself, a collage, one that groups disparate scholarship into a whole that reveals how the technique may serve as a method of scholarship and as a wellspring of vibrant, even radical pedagogical utility. That was a lot of information, but that's what it looks like. <laughs> <clears throat> so currently in works is my Common Threads edition entitled, well currently titled, Teaching Art, Reimagining Identity, and it will be out November 1st of this year. So in my collection, I consider that identity is a concept that can be, has been, and remi remains to be considered from many different theoretical and ontological standpoints. For initiating this collection, I borrowed Mark Brocker's rather unconstrained definition of identity being, quote, the sense of oneself as a more or less coherent and continuous force that matters in the world, unquote. I suggest that through our students' identities, though our students' identities may constantly be reforming or changing, 
It is important for educators to be aware of the various components and desires that may constitute these identities. The quote, fundamental challenge for educators then, is to understand the multiple identity components and desires that pervade the educational field and to variously recruit, redirect, reinforce, circumvent, or neutralize these forces in all parties, and particularly in themselves and their students." Unquote. So I called papers from the last 20 years of VAR scholarship that illustrated a variety of ways to negotiate and engage complex identities in the art classroom, emphasizing ways to explore identity through art making, ways to reinforce identity in positive ways, and ways to enhance marginalized identities. So through this distinct opportunity, I hope to achieve the creation of a teacher resource for both undergraduate and graduate students to use in college courses as an additional text, and for art teacher practitioners to use as thematic inspiration in their K through two, K through 12 classrooms. So that was even more information, and I don't have an image, because it's not, so. So going forward, um, we aim to continue to be a recognizable journal in our field, domestically and internationally. Um, furthermore, VAR will continue a tradition that began in 1980 by publishing an article authored by the winner of the Excellence in Dissertation Research in Art Education Award. And this is an award given at the National Art Education Association Annual Conference, and it's in honor of the late Elliot Eisner. So we have also introduced a new award that honors early to mid-career scholars. Can you tell we were mid-to-career mid scholars? <laughs> um, who the Editorial Review Board has determined published the most important article within each open volume. This author or author receive, authors receives a small honorarium as well as the opportunity to present at our national conference where the award is presented by the editors and the scholarly, scholarly contribution is celebrated in front of a large audience. And so, wrapping up, as an editor of VAR, I can speak for my co-editor when we say that the collaborative relationship we have with the press has been invaluable and we hope it continues far into the future. I think this gives us a fantastic breadth of understanding of the way that the press has interacted with a huge variety of um, scholarly endeavors, um, you know, since uh, throughout the 20th century and into the 21st. So, does anyone have questions for any of our panelists? Yeah, maybe you could turn. <laughs> to some component on the humanities needs to be part of the current strategic plan on campus. Um, so my interchange with the humanities in crisis goes back to my undergraduate days when uh, I guess I should have known something then when I went to a meeting and I ended up becoming chair of the group. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I'm thinking about, you know, we all live in this environment where we see this massive hulk north of Green, defining the campus and defining the university and being for, in the forefront of a lot of the talk of why the university matters. Innovation, changing health care, changing food, et cetera, et cetera. This description of the things that the university press has been involved in is very humanities focused. All kind of very interesting reading, uh, each of the stories here. And I wonder if you want to, Billy, you might be in a better position here, but not the only one, to comment about the extent to which is the, if you will, the embattled state of university presses as a whole, or the challenge, the uphill fight they always have. Is that because it's been focused so much on humanities scholarship? Or in, is my impression of what the press puts out Story. I am aware of some, many of the social science titles 
the arts, edu arts education, the music, things of those nature, but you want to talk about the disciplinary coverage and where you see it going in the future? You got any hot science texts? That <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because the press did in its early years part of these monograph series, which evolved out of the university studies at in, that started in 1900. Mm -hmm. Those were, one set of those were biology, yes. one set of those were archaeology, yes. that kind of thing. And so, um, but you know, each press has evolved, evolves its own um, specialties, right? And so, the, and so the University of Illinois Press has, has its such a strong publication um, emphasis in the humanities and social sciences. Mm -hmm. And um, although I see, and I'm, I'm certainly not as outreach coordinator working at the press for the past three years, the, the exactly the right person to be answering this, but I would just say that I think, um, you know, we continue to publish books in the humanities that might not have uh, a huge number of books that you could say were purchased by individuals, but they have huge impact, right? I mean, we're, of course, we're producing this cutting edge scholarship that's award winning in a huge variety of fields, um, from film studies to sports history to African American studies and Latin American studies and ethnomusicology and, you know, these kinds of things that we are, are still, in my opinion, the central aspects of, you know, scholarly work that's coming out of our campuses. And so, um, you know, we're just, we're not science focused, um, mm -hmm. but I really see in, in some ways our centennial and like an effort like this, a way of us talking about how intricately connected all of our fine arts and humanities and social sciences are on the campuses. And I think the work that IPRH is doing in that respect is really trying to, to show what uh, what power and influence and importance that that the humanities continues to have. So I'll let Charlie or, or anyone else have any comment there. Not about the press per se, but well, no. I, I mean, I think it's particularly important, you know, given the history of strategic planning on this campus, where the rubrics that come out tend to be overwhelmingly science related, or at least not not humanities related. That you know, we have to um, um, emphasize the importance of the work we do and. The, Significance and relevance of it, um, and so it's it's encouraging to hear what Antoinette is doing you know, to make that happen. Questions or comments? Great. Well, thank you so much for coming. I encourage you. We have um, a number of items that the panelists. That they spoke about that you could look at back there and some other materials and cookies. So um, if you'd like to stay and chat for a minute, that'd be great. Thank you.